Good afternoon. Hello, hello. I am very excited to introduce this next trio of speakers who are going to be speaking about the earth and the sustainability of communities, natural resources, and the wildlife within it. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Rika Nakazawa, Group Vice President, New Ventures and Innovation at NTT. Rika is a senior leader, VC venture partner, best-selling author, and a frequent public speaker at tech-powered biz transformation across multiple industries. And you'll introduce the other panelists. Yes. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. All right. What a way to end an amazing AWE 2023. So I uh, am a bit of a veteran of the industry, starting in the world of extended reality, AR, VR, having worked at NVIDIA for four years. I left in 2010 and I did sell all my stock, so you can all collectively do a sympathetic awe. But, uh, you know, there, there are more important things in life than the, the you know, the stock boom. But um, so I um, am very excited to be here and to be joined by Shivam and Heidi. I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves in a moment here. And when we were discussing how we might want to punctuate this event, having worked at NVIDIA for a few years, when I was working in the developer, developer relations part of NVIDIA, one of the concepts that was introduced to me that I thought was so compelling was God mode. So in game development, there is an ability for game developers to go into God mode within the world of a game, or a hacker if they really wanted to jump in and, and to be a part of the game design. And God mode is the ability to do whatever you want in a game. I'm simplifying the, the terminology a bit. So we were thinking, OK, if this is indeed a simulation, and some of you might actually believe that it is, and we're in the matrix, imagine if we had the opportunity to go into God mode, each and every one of us, and to do what we needed to do within the simulation of the Earth, maybe even the galaxy, maybe even the universe. What would we do? Well, how might our ability to have that level of control and impact change the course of where we're going from a sustainability perspective. And sustainability is a very, very big word. And what we're going to do today in our conversation, a fireside chat without the fire, being sustainable that way, uh, we're going to explore some aspects of what needs to be done, who are the key stakeholders, what are the possibilities, and that way unlock the art of the possible, and hopefully inspire some of you to think a little bit differently about the impact and the role and the control that you have each and every day of how you work, live, and play. So that's a very humble and modest endeavor that we're doing here on stage. And so what I'd like to do first before we kick off the, the conversation is, Shivam, if you don't mind introducing yourself, and, uh, and then I'll ask Heidi to introduce herself. Oh, yeah. Thank you all for being here. It's, it's been a nice couple of days. Yeah, big conversation, big topic, but my name is Shivam Kishore, and I'm the senior advisor to the Digital Transformation Team with the United Nations Environment Program. Maybe I can take a couple of seconds to introduce what the United Nations Environment does, because it is quite a large entity, uh, and uh, the work that it undertakes is quite enormous in its breadth. And so essentially, the Earth, the planet, has three critical systems on which all life form depends nature, biodiversity, and climate, or nature, pollution, and climate. And as the Environment Agency, we are the stewards of these three critical systems, where we sit at the back end and we observe the critical systems across the world. And any time one of these critical systems starts to get a bit fuzzy or a bit off, we raise an alarm with the intention of then creating the right environments through either policy or otherwise to make sure that the systems can get in order so that's sort of the mindset, uh, that's sort of the work. And within that, what we're undertaking is the digital transformation work, which is really a conversation about how do we start to better leverage the capacity, the capabilities that the digital technologies award us to enable better environmental outcomes across these three critical systems. So we'll get into this conversation a bit more and a lot more, actually. <laughs> but back to you, Rika. Yeah, no, thank you, Shivam, and, and thank you for all that incredible work. And we'll dive more into your background and where a lot of your experiences really are coming to bear in that. Heidi, want to introduce yeah, I mean, yourself? First of all, it's an, it's an absolute honor to be here. Um, I checked out some of the sessions yesterday and just some really mind-blowing things that a lot of you are working on and 
Rika and Shavam, real pleasure to be here with you. So I'm a, I guess probably what you'd call a serial entrepreneur. Uh, I've been founding companies for most of my, what's getting to be a long career at this point. For the past 10 years, my focus has really been at the intersection of IoT and connected devices. Um, the last company that I founded is one that you know, had a great impact on me and in many ways was the on-ramp to my journey into sustainability. So in 2015, I was a co-founder of a company called Kenzen. Company's still uh, going strong today, so we are a physiology platform with a wearable front end that protects workforces across the globe from adverse health conditions. What we really focused on specifically, though, was the measurement or the prediction of core body temperature in high-risk environments. And so that brought me to mines in South Africa, in the Middle East, in Japan, uh, here in the U.S. as well, um, renewable energy companies, oil and gas companies. And, you know, what became very apparent to me was just on the human body what a disaster the you know, rising temperatures could have on one and how important the prediction of certain, in certain uh, health conditions were, which is basically what sensors do. They give you the opportunity to predict something before it happens. So that, that kind of brought me into a lot of energy companies and spiked a, a very um, strong purpose just in doing whatever I could to make the environment a better place. And so at the end of last year, transitioned out of the CEO role. So again, company founded in 2015 and in great shape. But you know, what I'm very focused on now is helping climate companies that are in that hard tech, deep tech space, which means a manufacturing and a science piece that have the ability to transform the energy system, uh, raise money and commercialize. So working with a sustainable cathode uh, manufacturer on that. And then also looking at other forms of capital because I think the capital stack and those who are backing a lot of these key climate companies is gonna look very different from what venture capital has uh, looked like in the past. So yeah, honored to be here. Yeah, so sustainability is, is a big word, and in the world that I've been working in, I'm writing a, a book about this topic actually around my thesis is that sustainability, or some of you know this as ESG, environmental, social, and governance, really became intensified during the pandemic for a lot of different reasons. So that's a theory that I have, and I'd love for you to share, and, and Heidi, starting with you, you know, how do you think about sustainability, and do you agree that it's something that became much more pronounced during the pandemic. And if you do agree, why do you think that is? I mean, I think what I remember is, um, you know, once we weren't going anywhere anymore, right? You're not getting in your car, you're not commuting places, there was no air travel, emissions are way down. We saw the difference that it made, certainly, within the environment. Um, I mean, I'm remembering photographs I saw of the Venice Canal and there were dolphins in it. So I think it became very apparent that with some action on our part, a huge difference could be made in the carbon footprint, which is really what a lot of sustainability comes down to. So I think just that awareness in general um, was something that, that certainly was highlighted um, mm. during the pandemic. And I think to a large degree, things that are in place today, like remote work, well, sure, that's in part because we all got used to the flexibility and nobody wants to be in the office all the time, but I think there was also an awareness of, um, I don't need to be driving every day to get somewhere, I can be home and you know, the carbon footprint that I'm personally creating can be a little bit less, so I'd agree with you 100%, yes. So do you that's... think actually, do you think that that realization that not doing something impacted the world around us then inverted means that we have more control or more impact than we thought maybe prior to the pandemic. Possibly. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I think before, and, and this goes for me too, like mm. when you heard climate tech and global warming, it was very amorphous. So it was certainly uh, a concept I believed in and I backed it, but it almost seemed overwhelmingly large. Like how do we even begin to make a dent in this? And I think you saw, you know, yes, a dent is actually possible. Um, I mean, I think the other, the other dent that I got exposed to was 
working with a lot of uh, wind power and solar companies and just understanding how mainstream that had become and that was clearly making a big difference in the energy mix, bringing emissions down. And then the third thing I'll say is just, um, we deployed during the, during the pandemic, uh, I felt we had uh, pilot agreements to roll out our wearable technology in Japan and South Africa. And I thought, oh shoot, you know, this just, this figures, now nobody can travel anywhere. And of course our pilots are now greenlit. So I thought it would never happen, but it was important enough to the safety managers on those work sites to say, you know, we have guys that are, and gals, that are dying of heat or they're having heat stroke, like we need to make this happen. And so we were prioritized and figured out a way to do it remotely, which was very challenging, um, teaching, you know, this is how you're gonna deploy this wearable SaaS solution with a cloud, all this sort of thing remotely. But it was, it was prioritized because heat injury on work sites has become that much of a problem. Yeah. Yeah, so, and Shivam, working at the UN and in the role that you're in, you're really hyper-focusing on emerging tech. And I asked you yesterday, I said, well, what did you think about AWE? Because it was your first time at this conference. And you remarked that it was the first time you've been in a space where it's been so immersive. Uh, and really, it made you, it, 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 you had some realizations around it, perhaps. And so, with some of the aha moments that you had, I'd love for you to, Tell us you know, what you believe and what you've seen to be the trajectory between pre-pandemic to post-pandemic. How has sustainability re really evolved in your world, especially yeah. as you're working in the UN? And then what, where and how do you think this community and AWE, augmented world technologies can, can play in that? Yeah, that's a loaded question. But I think also I would like to comment a bit about this idea of sustainability and whether or not our perception of sustainability and our relationship with it has changed because of the pandemic. I think I've come to understand that it is not so much sustainability, but a relationship with resiliency has been transformed over the course of the pandemic. And if you look at resiliency, whether that's economical resiliency, environmental resiliency, or social resiliency, has heightened. Mm. And that is what the pandemic has allowed us to perceive a bit better, is how resilient are we? Whether we're looking at supply chain and how do we make sure our supply chain is a lot more transparent or resilient to the impacts that the pandemic brought about, or is our workforce more resilient or the way we manage our own personal lives more resilient to such shifts. So, and that resiliency in some aspects translated to sustainable outcomes. And we have started to equate that resiliency can bring about sustainability if exercised in intentional ways and if allowed to continue mm. in strategic ways. And so I think that's what the pandemic has done. It has allowed us to realize that we need to be more resilient, but more importantly, that resilience no longer is just an economical equation. It is also an environmental and a social equation. Mm. And if we can exercise both those aspects, then we can exercise a lot more governance agency over how we function as a society, as a corporate, as an individual. And so I think that is sort of what stood out to me through this exercise. And yesterday, again, it was the same conversation where it was, so this is my first time at AWE, uh, you know, and this has been quite a lovely experience just to observe and, and play with a lot of the immersive tech that is around. But the thing that stood out to me is the capacity that the immersive technologies or XR technologies offer in mitigating the psychological gap that we have today as a society. What I mean by that is one of the biggest barriers that I have come to see in the world of sustainability is the, not that we as humans don't want to empathize with what is happening across the world, we are limited in the capacity to do so. And listen, until we have the luxury or the unfortunate circumstance of going through a certain event, it becomes very difficult for us to act upon it. Mm. And what immersive technologies allows us to do is that is close that psychological gap. So I can be here, but witness or experience or come to understand what a particular event in a particular part of the world could look like, more importantly, look like, but also what it could feel like emotionally. Mm -hmm. And that has the capacity then to bring about certain behavioral and emotional changes that allow us to then exercise our agency to act. Mm -hmm. in a lot more immediate and a lot more urgent manner. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is quite a powerful undertaking. Mm -hmm. 
And do you think that's going to continue even as people kind of go back to a new normal? Like that, that intensification that happened and the role that technology, well, the uh, augmented world or XR, AR, VR is benefited from the massive digitalization and digitization of assets and the digital, digitalization of processes. Uh, and now there's been a bit of a pullback, right, with, with the term, even using the terminology metaverse. We're all very, uh, very fierce advocates in this room and beyond. But do you, do you think that this shift and this greater opportunity to leverage these capabilities, these technologies, will continue on the momentum? And I ask this from a global perspective, because in your role, you go to different parts of the world, and I'm sure you see stark contrast in terms of capabilities and availability of different tech. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think, so there's two parts of the question. I think first is, the way I have come to see, um, in, through my own role, through my own personal experiences, is I don't think I'm comfortable saying that I'm an advocate for a particular kind of a technology. What I am an advocate for is the intentional use of any given technology. So I think we need to divorce the technology from our ability to use it and how we use it. Tech in itself is a tool, I've come to believe, and the way we use it is what will dictate the outcome of that given technology. And so that is something that is the first sort of thing to bring about in this context. And the second thing is, yes, definitely across the world, in, in our context, sort of we are very focused on, on the environmental context of sustainability, right? So if you're looking at the global world, what are we trying to do? I think two key things stand out. First is the environmental data itself. Like how do we get access to and harmonize better quality environmental data across the world? And secondly, how then do we use it to create better analytics and forecasting that allows us to better understand what might be the changes that might be coming through, mm -hmm. which can allow the countries then to better prepare for what is to come. In that, the immersive conversations becomes very interesting because with forecasting, which is a more descriptive way of putting forward information where you're saying, this is something that is happening or about to happen. If you want to move or shift or transition from that conversation to a more prescriptive way, which is, this is what is about to happen, but this is what we can do about it, and here's how. That conversation, the immersive technologies can play a critical role mm -hmm. because of that agency to, again, award the ability to experience what things could be. Mm -hmm. And so that, I think, is a very exciting part for me to explore as to what and how can we collectively come about or think about use cases and technologies mm -hmm. to progress that pathway. Because yeah. I think that is quite an interesting conversation there. So, so around predictive and prescriptive, you know, Heidi, you, you, the world that you were inhabiting was very much about that in terms of yeah. managing towards safety, yep. well-being, health. Uh, and so I'm going to bring up the new favorite acronym, AI. Uh, right. And I'd love for you to share your views because I, you've been a technologist your entire career and really harnessing new ways to think about that. What role does AI play in enabling some of the things that Shivan was talking about in conjunction with so the wearable tech? And we know that in the immersive world, we do need that uh, accompaniment of hardware sure. to fully be able to do that. So what, what do you see happening in, in the horizon around yeah. the, the way that AI integrates? I also I want to comment on something that uh, Siobhan was saying earlier, because you were asking about sustainability mm -hmm. and will it, will it be pervasive now because the pandemic has rolled back. And, and I think it will. And the reason is because not only did we see the good that can come of it and the impact that we can all have, but I think security came as, a, as an issue too. So I think whether you're depending on your political affiliation or maybe it doesn't necessarily need to go with any political affiliation at all, whether you're seeing it as good for the environment or you're seeing it as energy security, supply chain security, food security, this made, I feel, individuals that never thought they might pay attention to anything like this need to pay attention to it. And it just so happens that making things, when possible, more local, which is also more sustainable, is going to bring that security forward, which is a lot of what the Inflation Reduction Act is all about, right? 
But I think, um, so I'm working with a sustainable cathode manufacturer right now, and you know, one of the reasons that they've got some momentum, they're part of the, the battery space, is because they can do everything locally and they can do it without water, which is less of a carbon footprint. So, you know, we're looking at building um, that manufacturing plant in Kansas, which is interesting, right? So, you know, that is a, that's a red state, but it's also what happens to be part of battery alley. So a lot of, and their Panasonic has put, I think, $4 billion into this, into this plant, and there's other such investments that are being made in Tennessee and South Carolina and Georgia, in large part because there's the space to actually build them. But, you know, the reason that, that this is being embraced now more holistically is because, A, it represents security, but I think where sustainability didn't have as much impact before is because the economics weren't there, right? So battery and EVs, this is probably the first example of something that's actually going to go mainstream, electrification, right? It's kind of an on-ramp to electrification. So I think, you know, one learning is if the economics aren't there, it's not going to move forward. And now there's this uh, aspect of security that scares the bejesus out of people, right? It's like if, the, if we don't control the supply chain, if there's not enough food, if there's not enough energy. So this has meant there's been much more of a commitment. Now, just thinking quickly about how could extended reality and God mode, as you said. So I had to actually Google what that was because I was in a game mode. And I was like, well, if I could make any decision, maybe it's like going back to the past and making different decisions. I don't know. But if we're looking at what could be done today, I think it's being able to look holistically at systems. Mm -hmm. So we were talking about this a little bit in the, in the back room. Like we see very myopically as humans. We only see kind of what's in front of us. But if we could see an entire system and how that impacts good and bad, where we could resource things, you know, what our carbon footprint is perhaps, that would make a lot of difference in efficiency. Uh, cost effectiveness, but also in uh, sustainability. So back to your original question. Um, so sensors are all about predicting certain things. And, you know, there's, so I've dealt mostly with on-body uh, sensors. So predicting, this is like Fitbit. Fitbit isn't telling you what your heart rate is. It's predicting what your heart rate will likely be. And it's the same with any kind of physiological prediction. And now it's, there are sensors all over the environment, right? So we're building smart cities. You know, it's raining. Might it flood? Well, there are sensors and drains now that are telling you mm -hmm. this might happen. So it's predicting. So I think, you know, and this is a little bit like being in God world, right? So sensors are kind of helping you predict the future. But what's happened is now there's all this information, all of these different. And so, you know, when we were at Kenzen, we started out thinking, well, we're not just going to look at core body temperature, we're going to look at all of these other adverse conditions and we're going to measure all these different signals. And what we found out as a startup of 22 people with really sharp scientists was like, holy moly, we can't do all this. It's too much information for us to be able to compute. So we started with one thing, otherwise known as the market entry, core body temperature. But that was still highly complicated because it's dependent on, you know, if you're susceptible for a heat injury, are you a man, are you a woman, what is your age, what are your pre-existing health conditions, have you ever had a heat injury before? So there's a lot of data just for us to send that one little, basically, vibration that says, hey, you might be, it looks like you're up for a heat injury. So it, there's sensors everywhere. Sensors help us predict things, climate, right? So adverse weather events, this can tell us, like a, a fire is going to happen here, right? We have satellite, we have a lot of data from space now, so there may be a forest fire in California, there may be a flood in New Orleans, all of this information. So AI at its best is going to be, as we were also talking about, it's going to simplify accurately that information and present it to the right person at the right time so decisions can be made in the right way. So, you know, having more information is good. It's also complicated, but I think if we are in God mode, and I think we, we all truly are in a way, right? We're able to have more data, more information, but it's, get, it's having that right information to make the right choices mm -hmm. for sustainability and also something that I know you and I have talked about, just climate justice a little bit too, right? Yeah, making sure those that are in places that don't have trees that were, that were, 
making sure that they, they have a, a way to get shade, a way to be safe. Um, <clears throat> all of these are things that sensors help us predict. Yeah, you know, I, I've stopped watching, for those of you who fly, um, trying to minimize my flying for obvious reasons, but still fly a bit. And uh, I don't have a TV at home. I haven't had a t TV at home for a couple decades now. So it's an indulgence for me, seat in front of me the, with the monitor. So, But I have stopped watching the documentary things because I end up just sobbing on the entire flight. Because when I see even a two-dimensional screen, the polar bear that's starving to death on an ice block, it just rips my heart out of my rib cage. But you know, when I think about just that experience that I have on a two-dimensional screen, one of the things that I do think about with regards to AR, VR, XR is that as sensors and machine vision and things are able to capture the impact of what's happening on Earth and that we all have a role to play in it, can the VR and AR experiences help us empathize? And, and this is where I'm going to divulge a little bit about Shivan's background. He spent six months in a monastery, and we talked about that a bit last night. And so, you know, we were talking about how we're all part of a collective energy or vibration, call it, or a collective consciousness. And so, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts, Shivam, on the role that that immersive experience can play on evoking that, so yeah. that when we are in a mode of, of God mode, you know, how is that going to empower us to be able to take better action? Yeah, I think one comment I would make also before is something that Heidi just touched upon, but Rico also touched upon, and this is the idea of tech as a leverage for sustainability. You touched upon this idea that we are, the economics are starting to make sense, so we are starting to leverage tech in more intentional ways to enable sustainable outcomes. I think one key difference that we observe in the emerging technology world that is different to the traditional technologies, whether that's health tech or you're talking about infrastructure, which is you know, your bridges yeah. and the buildings and so on, is that we have taken a lot more agency to feel all right with putting a lot of people at harm at the expense of certain other factors, which we don't do in the case of other kinds of advancements that are also needed for our well-being. We make the case for healthcare as an easy one. If I told you that this equipment has a little bit of a chance that it might work or it might not work, chances are very high you would not be willing to work with that equipment. Same thing for a building. If I told you, yeah, this is a building that you're going to live in, it has got about a 10% chance it might fall over the next year. Chances are very low that you might be willingly going into that building. But we don't award that same level of scrutiny when it comes to the emerging technological ecosystem as a whole. Mm -hmm. We've somehow come to accept that it's all right. If a certain amount of population is being harmed, it's all right. And the conversation then becomes, is it actually all right? And who decides if it's all right? And what population are we talking about? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I think that's where it gets very interesting and very fuzzy. So I think we have to be a bit more cognizant, this idea of fail fast, the sort of valley mindset that has permeated now the global technological ecosystem of fail fast, build fast, release fast, and let's see what happens, has to be transformed a little bit to take into account a bit more in a deeper way what is the consequence of this action and this arc of growth and development? Mm -hmm. The do-no-harm principles that apply to other spheres of our advancements that are also needed for our well-being, why is it that they do not apply to this ecosystem? What makes it so different? And those questions will perhaps allow us to better indulge in conversations than then allow us to build in the right policy frameworks, the right guidelines, the right principles to build these technologies with the same mindset. Same thing applies for immersive technological ecosystem. Yeah. I mean, yes, they have definitely an opportunity to realize, and there has been studies done on this where it has been shown that XR technologies do have the capacity to elicit or bridge that psychological gap that we were talking about earlier, and it has the ability to influence behavioral and emotional shifts in us as a society that is better than other technological advancements that we have come through. Um, that can emulate then, personally speaking from my own personal, very personal experience of having the opportunity to spend time in a monastery, to get ordained as a monk. It allowed me to also then realize a larger sense of empathy without the immersive experiences. But everybody does not have the luxury to go through yeah. the experience, nor the time. And so 
In offset of that, yes, immersive technologies can allow us to create a larger sphere of empathy that allows us to act in a more responsive manner rather than a reactionary manner. The question is, though, for me, how can we do it so that we ensure that the unintended consequences or the externalities are taken into account also? Right? So we don't say, oh, yeah, this is working for half a population, but half a population is causing mental chaos. But that's all right. Mm -hmm. Because that is what we are doing today with technological advancements. Yeah, we are saying, yeah, this is working for some section of the society, and it's causing some good, uh, but some are suffering. But that's all right. Yeah, and well, that becomes very important: is to build those principles in into the immersive tech ecosystem and take those sort of law of externalities, as you may, into mm -hmm. account. Well, my mental chaos preceded any technology, <laughs> but um, so I want to touch on. You mentioned policy, so. Some of the entrepreneurs that are in the room watching or re revisit the replay on this discussion, there is money there from the federal government. You mentioned the Inflation Reduction Act uh, and a lot of money going into climate tech. So, and Shivam working at the UN, and I know Heidi, you've worked with states and policymakers. Do you have any recommendations on how content creators, developers, entrepreneurs, technologists might want to think about the public private? collaboration that's needed to help either fund or drive support towards some of the innovation that's happening in XR, AR, and VR? I mean, I can start. Uh, what, what my experience has been, and then I'll, I'll get to your question, is in trying to bring this cathode manufacturer, which again is part of the EV battery supply chain, it's kind of in the midstream. Uh, there's upstream, midstream, downstream, just like oil and gas, they're in the midstream. and there are tax credits Kansas can recognize and this company by going to Kansas through the Inflation Reduction Act, which is billions of dollars. So along with Infrastructure Act, CHIPS Act, there's a lot of things that kind of coalesce together. What I found, um, and I was put in touch with um, the, uh, the state, not the State Department, the Department of Commerce uh, at Kansas in Kansas, and they they're overwhelmed, and I think a lot of uh, states are like that. And by the way, the reason that I know so much about Kansas is I am living there now, is I ended up moving Kenzen there from New York. We were back by Mars Health, but uh, when we pivoted to industrial workforce safety, I knew the venture capital community in Kansas City well, and we were able to raise about $10 million there. So yay for mid-markets. Um, so that's how I knew Panasonic was, was building a, um, a plant there. So what I have found is that the policymakers at the state level are a little bit confused. They're not, it's, it's very overwhelming in terms of understanding how to actually uh, deploy the capital. And so I think when, once I understood that, and then I even went to the city level because the Panasonic plan is literally like in the next city, DeSoto, Kansas, to where I live, like way out in the middle of nowhere, is to sit down with the government officials and really tell them, this is what we're doing, this is what it's going to mean for Kansas, this is why we want to be here. In this case, the land has been pre-designated to, used to be military land, so that's all set, that makes it it's simpler to uh, move it forward. I think that there's been a lot of these wonderful government programs that you're right, like should be this amazing tailwind, and they are from a, a regulatory, from a policy standpoint. So the Infrastructure Act, again, CHIPS, um, and, then, and then the IRA, but I think there's just a lack of understanding of exactly how can we use this. So on the augmented reality, extended reality front, I think you know, you can build something that will imagine what the future will look like and what it can mean. And there can be little prompts, uh, both on the economic side, both on the carbon offset side, for, for holistically for how a project would work. And I think, you know, I can, I can just speak for Kansas. Like, it, it, this is difficult things to understand, like what a cathode is and an EV battery, and there's all these different parts and like, blah, it's overwhelming. So. If you can have it in a in a make it accessible, if there's an on ramp there where you can visualize it, understand it from a, an economic standpoint, understand what jobs it's going to create, and then understand what it will do for in Kansas, I'd flip it to energy security. Honestly, um, Exxon Mobil now just uh, they're they have a huge. Um, investment they've made in Arkansas in mining lithium. So they didn't do too much ExxonMobil with renewables, right? So they didn't get on that bandwagon with BP and Shell and some of the others. They weren't motivated by that. 
But the minute that they saw EV batteries were taking off, like, shoot, yes, we're going to make a, an investment in Arkansas. So I think if you flip it around to security and incentives and capital and economics, you get people on board pretty quickly. And the way to visualize that through extended reality, I think, would be completely uh, powerful because it's abstract otherwise. So I think just the visualization and then, and then the understanding and whether it's uh, looking at getting a huge initiative through, like we're building a cathode plant, or just Heidi going to Starbucks, right? I, I drove there. What does that mean? What, am I what emissions am I putting out in the world? Where did the coffee come from? What's the impact? All of that is something that can be realized by extended reality. That yeah. But you remind me that during the gold rush, they say it's not the people that were panning for gold that made the most money. It was the people that set up the shops to sell the picks and the shovels and all the accoutrement to enable that to happen. So in some ways, one, one discussion I had around is, is how um, AR, VR creates these simulations so that you can model a, a factory without first having to build stuff. Because when you build stuff, there tends to be a lot of waste in the system as you're trying to map to a blueprint that may not exactly turn out that way. So I think that there's an opportunity for the industry to be that, that axe and, and, and <laughs> I'm like just stepping on thin ice because I don't know all the tools that are used, but they can provide the tools that are going to make those organizations that need to do industrial uh, work be more sustainable in how they do that. Absolutely. Digitalization. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would I resonate with that. I think so for us at the Environment Program, there's three large areas of work that we're focusing on, right? First was, like I was sharing with you, it's the environmental data and analytics. How do we sort of first create a robust ecosystem of the right quality, high sort of robust data and that we can then build analytics upon? The second one is influencing the, the private sector, the financial markets and the policymakers in an intersectional way to create the enabling environments to allow for the right policy frameworks to come through. And the last and very important piece is the capacity building, which is how do we sort of work with these stakeholders across the different sectors, private, government, financial, academia, to build in the right capacities that allow them to, in some way, foresee what might be the best action or a pathway to take when it comes to environmental progress or sustainability. And what Heidi said is very important because the ability for us at the moment to forecast pathways and scenario planning. So for example, if we say, here's five policy pathways that we could perceive that might be a possibility over the next little while. Today, we have the capacity to forecast in the sense that we can say, based on these five policies, these might be the outcomes and we can sort of somehow relate with them. But the ability to take those pathways and to see them and feel them mm. can perhaps allow us to then make the better choices. And I think that's an enormously powerful undertaking. Right? If you look at it, yeah. especially across the global levels, the ability for us to see the potential impacts of the po different policy pathways that we have available to us, mm -hmm. and the ability for us then to act upon them becomes a lot more higher because we can touch and feel them. Yeah. Not just the pathways, but the outcomes that those pathways present. Yeah. And I think that's also where AI comes back into play, right? Strongly because so. Yeah. Strongly so, yeah. So it's a combination of emerging technologies, immersive being one, AI being, of course, the underpinning tech to most outcomes today. I mean, in some way, if it's not co AI, it's at least ML or large learning models in some way. So large data models. Data models, yeah. 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 So um, we're, we're coming to the end of our fireside chat. And, and what I'd love for you to do, and, and folks here as well, Imagine that you could just freeze the Earth for a moment and you could hover above any part of the Earth and any, at any level, and you can dive into any building of, of office or business, anything education. I'd like to ask Heidi and Shivam, mm -hmm. like, what is the one, or where would you start? Like, where would you go? What function, what capacity, what industry, what sector? And what change w would you make if you had the ability to be in God mode to change the trajectory that we're on? <laughs> this, this, was, this was not a question. Simple, <laughs> simple question, a, simple answers. This was a trick question <laughs> here. Simple question, simple answers. I mean, I guess like there's so many things that pop. The first thing I said, I was thinking was just like I'd go to the Ukraine and figure out a way to you know, shore up energy so Germany doesn't have to rely on coal and go like 200 years backwards. But 
I mean, I think, you know, what I've been very involved in because of Ken Zen is I got some exposure to energy, and that's the part that I know best of this transition. Like, there's other things to focus on, biodiversity and food that are equally as important if you're going to have a holistic uh, conversation. But the one area that I know is, is energy and uh, just this path to electrification, which I think is... Uh, extremely important um, just from a it, it, sustainability, like this is, that's going to be the underpinnings of any, everything. And I also think it's an enormous financial opportunity, um, which means it's going to happen fast, which is good. What stands in the way a lot of times um, is permitting, I think. Um, so just on a very granular, like this isn't, I'm going to come down and make, you know, the sun shine so all the solar panels can absorb sun and windy so we can have all the wind storage we need. Because I actually think electrification is more important than both of those things um, because I think wind and solar together is only estimated to, at best, to give us 30% of what we're going to need and the storage there isn't, isn't very long. Um, so I think just moving, it, it just takes so long for approval because of the permitting. Like that is, the, that is an area that you just stub your toe on every single time, more than, more than anything else, uh, more than politics. So just away from and, and a global and it's different everywhere um so just globally to be able to remove those barriers as shivam said it's it's very complex you've got you know you've got government you've got private you've got public and then getting these companies backed financially which is you know what i've been doing a little bit of work on it, it's entirely different than any other type of venture capital uh, or company that I've, I've had to raise capital before and so like for better or for worse like one skill that i've developed is fundraising you kind of have to you're thrown in if you're in the startup world and vc is just it's not built for sustainable energy, hard tech, deep tech, you need what is called a patient capital, right? Which means that there's not an exit horizon of three to seven years, because if you're looking at built worlds, if you're looking at energy, if you're looking at transportation, you're looking at a 12 to 18 year commercialization and exit horizon. And you also need to understand things like project financing. So this is something that I've had to learn, but it's a very complicated capital stack. So if one thing could be removed, the permitting process, which can really hold things up, I would just remove that because I think electrification and then the storage of that energy, batteries and electrification is going to change everything. And I think that EV, uh, you know, the, the world of electric cars is just the on-ramp. Like that's the, that's the economic validation for what is going to be a global transformation. Hmm. Yeah, this is such a, a brilliant insight. But I think for me, I would say I've thought about this question not in the same sort of phrasing, but in different other phrasings and multiple times throughout my life. One thing that keeps coming back to me again and again is at the moment, there's two things I would say. First is our overall economical system. Over the last many years, we've come to accept a system that is premised on continuous growth, as in the economy must grow at all costs, because that is what our other systems depend on, is what we have come to accept and believe. The challenge with that is growth is fundamentally tied to our idea of consumption, consumption in X number of factors, whether that's ecological consumption or human consumption in some way, shape or form, it is consumption. So if we have come to accept that the economy must keep going without a cap, which means the consumption must keep growing without a cap, the challenge that it presents is we live in a world that has a cap. And so that creates a mathematical paradox where we cannot keep growing, we cannot keep this infinite hunger for growth in a world that is limited with finite resources. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to have more intentional conversations about realizing different models of looking at how we work with the economy first. And I think what that will then allow us to do on a more individual level is allow us the agency to start to perceive our role as active citizens versus passive taxpayers, which is what most of us have become in the society today. Yeah. That is because most of our faculty, most of our energy, most of our capacity is focused on being a part of the system that almost in some way gears us for that growth mindset, which means a lot of energy then goes into accumulating and consuming 
Intentionally and unintentionally is a different conversation, but that is the reality of the world that we've come to inhabit. Mm -hmm. And so I think those two, in some combination, might perhaps allow us to see the world, perceive the world in a way that might allow us to divorce well-being and success from consumption. And that can then also allow us the capacity to experience our role on this planet in more holistic terms, which then naturally can potentially translate to a true definition of sustainable living, which is yeah. taking on the planet and then living it on for seven generations, like which is indigenous principles across the world have, have, have been sharing with us in all their wisdom for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, I would take that notion of next generations. If I could freeze the world and sustainably manufacture, manufacture a whole load of different kinds of headsets in partnership with HTC's Magic Leap, Meta, and so on, is I would go into all the schools in elementary and equip every child with a headset of some kind or another. Because they're the ones that are going to be inheriting the hot mess, pun intended, that we're leaving behind. And the community here is focused on change, transformation. And so equipping, equipping that generation and the kids that are unfettered by their imagination to see what they might be able to do to use that technology to drive the change that needs to happen at scale. Mm -hmm. Of course, the big question is how do you manufacture all this <laughs> sustainably? But you know, this is all just theorizing and, and, and uh, thought, thought experiments anyway. So, but um, yeah, so thank you so much for sharing your wisdom today on a Friday afternoon at the end of a spectacular show. And I just want to thank those of you who were able to join us here today and for anybody who's watching for being here and please Think about that word agency and the role that you can play each and every day in your family, with your children, in your communities, at work, and in the incredible ways that you're all innovating towards how the step change of transformation can drive us forward towards those sustainable impact and outcomes. And uh, we'll look, for, look forward to staying in touch. And thank you again. Thank, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for thank all your work, Rika. You've thank you. certainly moderated a lot of these wonderful panels. <laughs> no. So you're doing a great job. This is fun for me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.